Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, may I invite you to please rise to join me in giving a warm welcome to His Majesty, Sultan Haji Hassanal Bolkia Muizzadin Wadaullah, Sultan and Yang Di Pertuan of Brunei Darussalam, Mr. Tio Chi Yen, Deputy Prime Minister, Coordinating Minister for National Security and Minister for Home Affairs of Singapore, and Mr. Wong Ah Long, Deputy Chairman of the IC's Board of Trustees. Your Majesty, Deputy Prime Minister, and Mr. Wang Ah Long, Excellencies, Royal Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, good morning and a very warm welcome to the 34th Singapore Lecture. The Institute of Southeast Asian Studies has the privilege to host the 34th Singapore Lecture, which will be delivered by His Majesty the Sultan and Yang Di Pertuan of Brunei Darussalam. To begin the proceedings for today, I have the pleasure to invite Deputy Prime Minister Mr. Tio Chi Hien to deliver his opening remarks, introduce His Majesty, and chair the proceedings. Deputy Prime Minister, sir. Your Majesty, Sultan Haji Hassan al Bolkiah, Muizadin Wadaullah, Sultan and Yang Di Petuan of Brunei Darussalam, Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, I would like to welcome all of you to the 34th Singapore Lecture. Your Majesty, it is our great pleasure and honour to have you with us this morning. On behalf of the organisers, I thank Your Majesty for agreeing to deliver the Singapore Lecture on the occasion of your state visit to Singapore. Thanks in large part to His Majesty's support, Singapore and Brunei enjoy a very special relationship. As the two smallest countries in the region, we share a common strategic outlook. We have been close partners since the 1960s. This long-standing friendship was forged by the common need to secure our country's futures in what was then a turbulent region. Unique cooperative arrangements in defence and currency interchangeability are key pillars of our close bilateral ties. Our small size also means that ASEAN has been and will continue to be the cornerstone of our two countries foreign policy. Brunei joined the ASEAN family shortly after independence in 1984, and we have collaborated very closely within ASEAN through the years. We have both instinctively, we both instinctively understand the importance of regional stability. We also understand that more can be achieved if countries in the region are integrated as one ASEAN community. Brunei chaired ASEAN in 2013 at a critical juncture in ASEAN's development. ASEAN's ability to stay united, manage disputes, and play a central role in the evolving regional architecture was being questioned. After taking over the chairmanship, His Majesty pledged to encourage consensus without compromising the national interests of member countries and our partners. Putting word into action, His Majesty visited all the ASEAN member states and most of our dialogue partners last year 
for consultations. This quiet diplomacy helped ASEAN to regain credibility and navigate challenges such as the South China Sea issue. His Majesty's skillful chairmanship of ASEAN enhanced the grouping standing as well as that of Brunei, both regionally and internationally. As chair, Brunei also helped to refocus ASEAN's energy on achieving an ASEAN community by end 2015. Brunei also presided over our leaders' adoption of the Banda Sri Bagawan Declaration on the ASEAN Community's post-2015 vision and the creation of a high-level task force to review ASEAN institutions, processes and external relations to complement the development of ASEAN's post-2015 vision. Following Brunei's successful ASEAN chairmanship, His Majesty is eminently qualified to speak on today's public lecture topic, the future of ASEAN. Having assumed the throne in 1967, His Majesty is the longest serving head of government in ASEAN and one of the longest reigning monarchs in the world. His Majesty is an experienced and respected elder statesman and has been a close observer and keen participant in ASEAN for the past several decades. His Majesty, therefore, has a solid grasp of ASEAN's past and present, and we are extremely privileged that His Majesty has agreed to share his vision for ASEAN's future with us today. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite His Majesty, Sultan Haji Hassan of Bolkia, Muizadin Wadaula, the Sultan and Yang Dipatuan of Brunei Darussalam to deliver the 34th, the 34th Singapore Lecture. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin Wa bihi nasta'inu ala umuri dunia wa din Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil mursalin Sayyidina Muhammadin Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa ba'du Good morning Deputy Prime Minister Tu Chihen Deputy Chairman of ICS, Wang Along. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I much appreciate your kind words of introduction, Deputy Prime Minister. And I would also like to thank you for your good work in strengthening overall Brunei-Singapore relations. It is a pleasure to be here, and my thanks to the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies for their invitation to participate in the Singapore Lecture Series and to speak on the future of ASEAN. I am honored to be here before such a distinguished audience with many of the region's leading thinkers. From early in ASEAN's history, institutions like this one have provided much needed frank and considered opinions that have helped to drive ASEAN forward and provided insight on how to improve the way we do things. ICS especially has been playing an important role from the start since its establishment in 1968, a year after the Bangkok Declaration which formed our regional grouping. The world then was a very different place. In 1987, 
I attended my first ASEAN meeting in the Philippines. It was the third ASEAN heads of government meeting and the first one since Brunei has joined the original five in 1984. Looking back, I was fortunate to be surrounded by many good friends, including former Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore. The Manila summit was convened in spite of the delicate security situation in the Philippines. The summit took place primarily as a show of solidarity for regional stability. Much has changed since then. Ge geopolitics have shifted while the global economy has also gone through various circles of boom and bust. Many countries in our region have achieved remarkable progress and made great strides in lifting their citizens out of poverty. And now, East Asia and the Asia Pacific contribute to 40% of global growth and one third of the world's trade. ASEAN has also changed growing in membership and confidence and emerging as a community next year. However, as has been the case in the past, the future of our region remains somewhat unpredictable. Ladies and gentlemen, this century has been called the Asian century. And whilst there are many lessons to be learned from history, the situation in Asia is unprecedented. Essentially, Asia's rise will bring changes to the current global strategic configuration. The pace of change in the region will continue to accelerate. China and India will be the major economic drivers with the U.S. remaining engaged in the region and the EU prevailing in Europe. With the shift of relative economic weight towards Asia, political power also follows correspondingly. New major and middle powers are emerging. Together, changes in their relationship will influence the strategic landscape. Such transformations are also accomplished by the increasing role of non-state actors, such as civil society organizations, multinational corporations, and international institutions. The terrain of international relations is more diverse. The future of Southeast Asia is tied to its neighbors in East Asia and the Asia Pacific. The challenge for ASEAN will be to establish its strategic place in this new configuration by playing a greater role in regional and world affairs to ensure the security and prosperity of its people. In the coming decades, we will continue to be confronted with different and possibly more intense challenges than we currently face. We are seeing worrying trends of weakening confidence and trust. We are concerned with the return of, with the return of explicit major power rivalry Historical and political divides still continue to fuel nationalistic sentiments between countries. Difficulties in meeting economic commitments and resolve maritime disputes are risking the region's potential. We are increasingly confronted 
with a host of transnational crimes related to terrorism, drug and human trafficking and cyber security. At the same time, we are witnessing a new threats such as extreme natural disasters and emerging communicable, communicable diseases. These challenges pose a present and imminent danger to our countries as their economic cost and consequences upon the livelihood of our people are enormous. We also have to address the increasing implications affecting those left behind by globalization. Ladies and gentlemen, the future of our wider regional architecture is very much a, wo a work in progress. We hope that it will become a region in which countries enjoy peace, prosperity, and progress, characterized by mutual respects, understanding, and cooperation. Ideally, it should be an open and inclusive arrangement with countries in the Asia-Pacific rallying around ASEAN. And it is imperative for our association to be proactive in shaping the future. Member States must continue to strengthen ASEAN and it is crucial that we address the resolved regional problems or issues through peaceful dialogue and initiatives. We need to ensure ASEAN's three community pillars are serving the region's interests. We must continue to be more responsive and strive to be a people-oriented organization. Our community will not succeed merely through the creation of layers of structures and endless acronyms, nor should it serve solely as a vehicle, vehicle for government officers to meet. The community should reside in the hearts and minds of our people, our youth and women, farmers and fishermen, and the, small, and the many small and medium businesses forming as essential part of our economies. It must guarantee the security of their livelihood, provide them clean air and water, improve their skills, and offer bright prospects that open up opportunities for their future. They must be central in the agenda of the community pillars. This is why it is important ASEAN enhances its internal coordination and cooperation to ensure our initiatives are carried out promptly for the benefit of our peoples. I therefore welcome the recent statement of the Prime Minister of Malaysia to make a people-centered ASEAN is the main focus of the country's chairmanship next year. And I urge the speedy realization of ASEAN soft connectivity projects aimed at bringing about a sense of regional belonging amongst our peoples, including the use of new social media and cultural and educational exchanges amongst our youth. In short, more can be done to nurture an ASEAN mindset amongst our peoples to further promote regional harmony. Ladies and gentlemen, the success of the association in establishing robust relations with its many, with its many important external partners through a number of frameworks represents ASEAN's way of reaching out beyond our region in contributing to peace
stability, and prosperity. Our shared interests are expanding and our common concerns are converging. Together with its partners, ASEAN should carry on its work to strengthen confidence, trust, and care for each other's welfare. In this regard, we need to emphasize the significance of promoting rules-based relations amongst countries in the region. It is important to work hard to raise our GDP, build better infrastructure, and expand markets for our goods, develop stronger integrated financial markets, enhance financial literacy, and create more jobs for our youth. As a region, Southeast Asia needs to be more competitive and innovative to play a greater role in the global economy. We should make certain there is sustained economic growth in ASEAN to avoid future social problems such as growing economic disparities and those caused by demographic changes. Gentlemen, to cope with its increasing tasks and responsibilities, ASEAN requires the support of a strong and dynamic secretariat that it is equipped with the necessary resources. This is the, to ensure the secretariat retains expert to effectively coordinate and carry out ASEAN's agenda in various areas, including executing regional responses to emergencies. This is especially crucial during the time of crisis. Humanitarian exercises that have been held in the past must be put into action when required, such as in the aftermath of Super Typhoon Haiyan. Last year, the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting Plus, Humanitarian Assistance and Disaster Relief and Military Medicine Exercise was held in Brunei. It was a landmark exercise among the defense forces of 18 countries aimed to promoting capacity building, enhancing interoperability and coordinating effective responses. I had the opportunity to observe military personnel for regional powers from regional powers such as China, the US, Japan, and India, all working together hand in hand. Personally, seeing all 18 countries working in unison to bring relief and assistance conveyed a very strong message of how meaningful our work can be, especially in reacting to emergencies. I therefore applaud Singapore's offer of the Changi Command and Control Center as a regional humanitarian and disaster relief co-host center. It will do much more to enhance our cooperation in this area. It is also in this manner that ASEAN and its partners can work together to address impending regional challenges through practical cooperation and thereby ensure our people will stand to benefit from greater stability. Ladies and gentlemen, as I mentioned earlier, a lot has changed since my first ASEAN summit meeting in Manila. The summits now take place twice a year and have grown far beyond just a showing of solidarity. In constantly preparing for our people's future, we are also constantly responding to various threats, risks, and challenges as they arise. 
At the same time, whilst our practice of consultation has been ingrained in the ASEAN way, our overall environment continues to evolve, and our association must adapt to these new emerging realities. With globalization and advances in ICT, close consultation will be even more important. We will continue to be guided by the ASEAN way, consensus building, mutual respect, close consultations, and exercising sensitivity on delicate issues. I foresee that there will be a need to be more inclusive and responsive in the way we work, taking into account the interest of our stakeholders and partners in ASEAN. ASEAN will also need to ensure that strategic trust and confidence is maintained through positive engagement, dialogue, and practical cooperation. Above all, as a community, we must determine our own destiny, and this will only be possible if we continue to be united, cohesive, and assert our leadership through ASEAN lab initiatives. Ladies and gentlemen, over the past 40 years, Southeast Asia has matured as a region, with ASEAN strengthening as an organization and the value of peace, stability, and development inculcated amongst our people. As we look to the future, our horizons will further broaden and the success of the association and its cooperation with its partners in East Asia and the Asia Pacific will become more ever more, will become ever more important. It is my wish to see that as a community of Southeast Asian nations, our region progresses on the basis of stronger neighborly relations, closer friendship, pragmatic cooperation, and inter interdependence so that peace and prosperity is shared by all. Wabillahi tawfiq wal hidayah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Your Majesty. Thank you, Your Majesty. It is now my honor to invite our Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Tio Chi Hien, to preside over the closing part of our program for today. Deputy Prime Minister, sir. Your Majesty, on behalf of the audience today, I would like to thank Your Majesty for delivering the 34th Singapore Lecture and sharing with us His Majesty's views on this very important subject of his vision for ASEAN's future. His Majesty has been uniquely placed to share with us the broad sweep of the history of ASEAN over the many years that His Majesty has been an active participant in and a shaper of the community's future. His Majesty shared with us the challenges that ASEAN faces and also his optimism that as a community we can work together for a better and brighter future. It remains now for me to thank His Majesty and to invite Deputy Chairman Mr. Wong Along to present a memento to thank His Majesty for sharing with us his views at this 34th Singapore Lecture today. Thank you very much, Your Majesty.
Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister, and thank you, Mr. Wong. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the end of the 34th Singapore Lecture. May I ask that you remain in your seats while His Majesty, our Deputy Prime Minister, and their respective entourages leave the ballroom. Thank you very much. This concludes our program for today, Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. Once again, on behalf of the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies, I wish to thank you for your patience and for being with us today at the 34th Singapore Lecture. We wish you a good day. Thank you very much.